Ben is a prolific author, I would say. He's written a, a rather a large number of books, seven books total. Uh, has a great board game, if you haven't played that. And uh, he's going to do his discussions around how paranormal investigation and skepticism intersect. So everybody give it up for Bryn Radford. Thank you, thank you. Appreciate your uh, coming out. Uh, as, uh, as before, uh, you know, I know there's lots of uh, stuff that you could be doing other than sitting here listening to me babble on. Uh, all sorts of cool other people who are doing interesting, fascinating things, costumes and whatnot. So I appreciate your spending uh, the next hour here, or 59 minutes and one second. Uh, I had originally in envisioned this as being a Q&A, and we'll certainly have plenty of time for Q&A, although it occurred to me that uh, I should probably start with, um, with sort of a, a little primer for those sort of maybe to, that would ground the discussion, because not everybody here is skeptics. Many of you are, but some of you have just sort of wandered in probably thinking I'm, you know, I'm doing Brian, maybe I'm Brian Brushwood or I'm doing some sort of magic or something. You probably have no idea what the hell is going on. Um, so let me give you more background on myself. Um, as, as you noted, I am uh, a research fellow with the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, CSI. I'm the deputy editor for Skeptical Inquiry Science Magazine. I've uh, written seven books, uh, contributed to about 20 books. I gave a talk earlier today on uh, organ theft urban legends. Some of you were there. Uh, and there's the whole, you know, they do your kidney stolen and it's sold in the black market. Uh, and there's a couple versions of that that was interesting. Uh, and then yesterday I gave a talk on crystal skulls. Uh, part of, it's one of the chapters in my new book, Mysterious New Mexico. So uh, more of my background. Um, I've, uh, I have a, a bachelor's degree in psychology, master's in education. I've been on CNN, Good Morning America, Learning Channel, Discovery Channel, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and um, usually the reason that I'm, I'm up here on TV is because there, there's, some, there's some, uh, some channel who's doing some investigation that, that, uh, that I'm an expert on. For example, anybody here seen a show called The Dead Files? Okay, a couple of hands there. Yeah, I was in, um, just uh, three weeks ago, I was in uh, Jamaica. I got a call from a producer for The Dead Files. I'd never seen the show, so she's like, oh, I'm a producer for Dead Files. I'm like... Okay, it's great. And what is that? Is it, on, is it a podcast? So anyway, it's, a, it's on the Travel Channel or something. And it's a, it's a TV show that has a, um, it, there's a, there's, there's two main stars. One is, a, I think, a retired New York City cop. And there's a, uh, another side who's a, a woman who goes around and she speaks to the dead, or at least that's what she thinks. That's what she claims. I don't quite know what she, what she does, but that's, that's, what, that's what they claim and they go into investigations. And uh, the reason I was called was because the, uh, the, um, the producer said, yeah, we're doing a show on, um, on the White Witch of Rose Hall, which is, uh, Rose Hall is a famous haunted plantation in Montego Bay, Jamaica. And I had actually written an, a book chapter in one of my books, Scientific Paranormal Investigation. Um, chapter 12 is on Rose Hall. And I, I went there and I did investigation and I uh, went into the history of it and I, I essentially solved the, solved the case. Um, it was supposed to be haunted by this demonic witch who's, uh, who'd murdered four husbands and there was all sorts of weird, creepy stuff going on, ghost photos and whatnot. So, uh, so anyway, in that case, they, they said, well, look, you know, we, we did some research and we're going to be doing something on this, on this plantation, and apparently you're the only person that investigated it and solved it. I'm like, well, yeah. So like, okay, well, we want to fly you out. And I saw it was, it was a Los Angeles number. Say, so you want to fly me out to L.A. or to Jamaica? Like, Jamaica. All right, cool. We can do that. I, <laughs> I, will, I will happily be your trained monkey for a day in Jamaica. So that was kind of cool. I have no idea when it's going to air, but it'll, it'll be on there at some point. So, and then I, I was on uh, a series called Is It Real? It was on National Geographic. Uh, it was a good series. Some a couple, a couple of people not, nodding who have seen it there. So anyway, um, so I'll be talking again sort of uh, the, on essentially applying science to the paranormal. Um, and I'll, gi I'll give sort of an overview of, of the strategies that I take uh, in terms of investigating everything from crop circles to Bigfoot to ghosts, things like that. Uh, I'm probably best known for having solved the mystery, mystery of the Chupacabra, the uh, Hispanic vampire beast, for those of you who know that. Uh, I wrote a book called Tracking the Chupacabra and uh, sort of examined all the different parts of that story and uh, everything from the folklore, the conspiracy theories behind it. Uh, so I've done 
any number of mysteries. So if there's a particular topic you're interested in, ghost investigations, cryptozoology, uh, crop circles, whatever, whatever weirdness you have a question about, I probably have investigated it firsthand, or I know people who have done research on it. So let me, uh, let me go ahead and start by giving some, some, some of the basic, uh, basic, basic tools in, involved in, in terms of how to approach these subjects skeptically and critically. So there's lots of there's a, many fundamental common misunderstandings about skepticism, science, and the paranormal, even among many skeptics. And one of the well, as a skeptic, one of the most important basic questions uh, and, and lessons that I've that I've often encountered that helps to solve mystery is is you have to question your assumptions over and over and over again. Whether I'm talking to a, a person who, who believes that they saw a ghost or a Bigfoot or whatever it is. Over and over again, they're, when they're telling me their story, they're presenting their claim to me, I can, I can, I'm listening to their narrative, and I'm hearing what they're saying, and they're making these, these un, unwarranted assumptions based upon their interpretations of what they experienced. And so they'll be, oh, I'll give you an example. Um, I, um, I was in, uh, I was in, um, in, uh, in uh, it's called Gold, Golden Horseshoe. It's uh, south of Toronto, between Toronto and Buffalo. And there's a... Um, a haunted place, it's called Haunted Fort George. It's supposed to be one of the most haunted places in, in Canada. And I was there for a TV show and I was doing, I was sort of the token skeptical investigator and they had all these other people and I'm like, yeah, I'm the, I'm the, you know, I'm the asshole, I'm the skeptic, yeah, come bring me in here, that's fine. And so uh, I, we spent an overnight and I think, I think total of three days there. And as we were wrapping up, a woman came up to me and she, uh, she's a, she was a ghost hunter. Uh, she's still there, as far as I know. And she said, you know, I, you know you've been here for a couple of days. I see you've, you've you know, done research into the ghosts and this other phenomena. She says, uh, you know, will you listen to my evidence? And I was like, sure. She says, well, I have an EVP, which for those who don't know, it's electronic voice phenomena. It's basically what are claimed to be ghost voices. Um, and so I said, sure, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll listen to what you have to say. She says, well, here's the deal. I was walking around Haunted Fort George, and she had a parabolic mirror, sort of a, looks like a gun. You see these on the sidelines of, like, football games. They're little disc things, and it basically uh, captures the sound. And, and I said, okay, what do, you, what do you have? And she says, well, I, I recorded a, a, a child ghost laughing. And I said, okay. I said, I, I, will, I will listen to your audio uh, that, that's fine. I'll, I'll listen to your evidence. I said, but before I do, let me ask you, how do you know? She's like, well, what do you mean? I said, how do you know what a child ghost sounds like? Because I don't. I mean, I don't I know what a human child sounds like. I can guess that. I don't know what a ghost sounds like, and I certainly don't know what a child ghost laughing sounds like. So if you're coming to me with your evidence and you're saying, this is what this is, I'm just going to ask you how... Why do you, how do you know that that's what you recorded? I mean, I'm not saying it's not. It, it, it could very well be. But if you're going to present it to me as evidence, I'm going to ask, why is that in your interpretation? And she didn't really have an answer. It was sort of like, oh. I was like, I'm not, this isn't a trick question. I'm just trying to explain to you that, you know, there's lots of interpretation in this. And so, anyway, so this is, this is where we get into questioning the assumptions. So there's a great quote from Bertrand Russell. It says, in all affairs, it's a healthy thing now and then to hang a question mark on the things you've long taken for granted. And again, it's, you know, if you're going to if you're going to present something as evidence and you're going to if you're going to have these assumptions about what you experience in terms of them being paranormal or potentially paranormal, look at look at the bases and the assumptions that, that underlie that premise. So here's another question that comes up. How can proven scientific uh, how, Proven scientific methods of research be used when, by definition, the paranormal is that which defies scientific explanation. I've heard this over and over again. So the idea is like, well, the paranormal, you, you know, we're talking, you know, things that the science can't explain, you know, ESP, ghosts, whatever else. I'm like, why do you think science can't explain that? It's like, what, what, what is this assumption that why, oh, well, you know, we, we, can't, we, we can't detect these things. This, the fact is, the paranormal doesn't mean something that defies scientific explanation. Uh, this is there's lots of different different uh, definitions that people use, you know. But basically, if if all the paranormal meant was it's something we don't understand, well, there's no shortage of things we don't understand. Uh, you know, in the in germ theory, for example, before germ theory was was around, 
you know, that was paranormal in the 1700s. People didn't know why one person got disease, another person didn't get disease. They attributed it to God's wrath, for example, or to take your pick. Um, so just because, just because we didn't then know, have, have the scientific answer for why something happened, and we do now, doesn't mean that it was once paranormal. It just means we didn't know what the answer was. And so the fact is that many paranormal things can be and have been scientifically tested, from Bigfoot hair to psychic powers. I've, I've spoken to many people say, oh, well, you know, the problem is that scientists, you know, that scientists someday, scientists should test uh, psychics. I was like, they have. Huh? Yeah, yeah, scientists have been testing psychics for decades. Huh? Yeah, do a little research. It's all there. <laughs> this, is, this has been done before. Um, you know, Cornell Labs, uh, you know, the, the Society for Psychical Research, etc. I mean, th there's ESP experiments done in the 1970s. It's not that no one has done this. It's the same thing with, um, or like ghosts. You know, people are like, oh, well, if only someone would bring science to ghosts, you know, and, you know, uh, that, oh, the, the people think, well, one of the things people think is that, is that ghost hunting only appeared 10 years ago with the TV show Ghost Hunters. I'm like, what are you talking about? It's like people have been looking for evidence of, of, of ghosts for well over a century. Uh, in Victorian England, it was very popular. People, women of the day would, would have, have little parties, and they would have parlor games, and they would bring people over. They would, they would try and use a Ouija board to contact the spirits. This is nothing new. The Society for Psychical Research in London, England, has been doing this since 1880 or something. So, so it's not that no one has looked into this. It's that when scientific methods are, 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 are applied to this, the, the evidence simply isn't there. And same thing with Bigfoot hair. Um, I've done a fair amount of research into Bigfoot, Bigfoot, Loch Ness Monster, other things like that, cryptozoology, and same with Bigfoot hair. In fact, earlier this year, uh, there was a research put out by a, an Oxford geneticist by the name of Brian Sykes. And Sykes did a, did a very thorough analysis. It was published in a peer-reviewed journal. So this is an actual geneticist who's doing work. And he, he had, a, for the last two years, he had a call out for anyone who, to, who, ha, who had what they believed was Bigfoot hair or Yeti hair, depending on what, what area of the world you're in, that was supposedly some unknown creature to submit it. So he got something like, I think it was like 300 and some samples. Some of them were too degraded to use. And they, they, they en ended up finding, I think, 200 and some. And every single one of them was identified. Some were elk, some were raccoons, some were moose, some were bear. One was human. Uh, there, was, there was a piece of carpet fiber that someone thought was Bigfoot hair. Uh, and so, so what happened was that every single one of these, when subjected to DNA testing, genetic testing, they were all identified. There's no mysterious hair. It, 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 it's right there. And yet, if you look in, in uh, books and magazine articles and blogs about Bigfoot, oh, well, this unknown hair. Well, as of, as of earlier this year, uh, ain't no, there's no mystery there. Um, that's not to say that next month or next year someone may not find a genuine piece of Bigfoot bone or hair, whatever else, that will revolutionize everything. That's simply to say that as of now, the evidence that has been presented that actually has been looked at by scientists uh, is, is, is uh, inconclusive at best. Here's a quote uh, from Hippocrates. It says, men think epilepsy divine merely because they do not understand it. But if they called everything divine, which they do not understand, well, there would be no end to divine things, right? Just because we don't understand something doesn't mean it's unknown, doesn't mean it's mysterious. It just means we don't know yet. Not necessarily paranormal. James Randi, the magician, uh, the famous magician who many of you probably are familiar with, uh, he's, he's part of the, uh, the James Randi Educational Foundation. He defines the paranormal as an adjective referring to events, abilities, matters not yet defined or explained by science. I, I, I personally, I use it to simply mean something that appears to be supernatural or seems to violate natural laws. Its, na its nature might or might not be supernatural, but it certainly appears to be, at least superficially. So when I'm going to investigation, my job is to, is to try and look for what evidence is being offered that's falsifiable. In science means we can test it. It's not, subject, it's not subjective, it's not, well, you know, it, it's not some anecdotal evidence, it's not just, you know, rumors. Some people say it's, this is something we can test. It's a, it's a, it's a piece of bone, it's a piece of hair, it's, it's something that's, that's tangible. 
And so many so-called paranormal topics are not outside the realm of science at all, and said they are indeed falsifiable. Um, I was doing a, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example here. I was doing a, um, a uh, I was on a TV show called Mystery Quest, and it was a haunted, it was a haunted place in uh, Carson, California. And I was there for, it was, the, it was called Annalbury Estates, and the Ghost Hunters had been there, and they'd done their, they'd done their dog and pony show there. And um, I had, I was, uh, we were shooting for like three or four days, and I was going back to the hotel, and the, the producer was driving us back, and I was there along with a, a, a ghost hunter. It was, it was a, um, I forgot the, I forgot, well, actually I do know his name, I'm, I'm not going to bother to tell you his name, but he, uh, he was with his crew, and they were like, okay, yeah, we're, we're, all, we're just, you know, we're, we're going to, it's been a long day, we're all heading back, she's driving us back to the hotel, and I said, and I, I had previously that day, I'd seen them, uh, they showed up in their, in their sort of ghost hunters mode. They had all this equipment, they had, you know, electronic voice, they had cameras, they had this, they had EVP, they had all, all EVP recording stuff, they had all sorts of high-tech gear. You know, he's bragging, like, we have $70,000 worth of gear here. It's like just cases and cases and cases and cases. And they're unloading this huge van. I'm watching. It took them three hours to unload. And, and as we're driving back, I said, um, so just so, you know, we're just, we're just chatting here. It's like, why is it that you think that, that we still don't have good evidence for ghosts? I'm, I'm just, you know, what's your opinion? I'm just curious as we're driving back. And he's like, well, you know, he says, I think it's because... Ghosts can't be detected through scientific uh, measurements. And I said, hold on, hold, hold on here. You've got $70,000 worth of gear. You've got cameras. You've got this. You've got that. You've got all this stuff set up. W what's all that for? I if you truly believe that ghosts cannot be detected by scientific instruments, that would be cameras, then, then what, what is all this stuff? He's like, oh, I hadn't really thought about that. And the producer's looking, she's just driving, she's like, oh, God, where's this going? And, and I wasn't, it wasn't a gotcha moment, I wasn't trying to trick him, I'm serious, like, you, you can't have it both ways. You can't say that the reason that we haven't found good evidence of ghosts is that ghosts can't be detected. Well, that's what ghost photos are. Every alleged ghost photo, that's, <laughs> that's, 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 that's something in the visible light spectrum that we can detect. So either all the ghost photos are not actually ghosts, that is, they're artifacts of, of the... The, the camera process, et cetera, et cetera, or they're, or they're real. I mean, you can't have it both ways. Either they can be detected by instruments or not. And this, this supposed ghost hunter who'd spent years doing this, it never occurred to him that his, ba his own premise is undermined by what the hell he's doing. So that that's sort of gives you some idea of some, some <laughs> where, where some of this can go. So the question is, how can you study something or be an expert on something that's never been proven to exist? And that's a fair question. Um, you know, I, what I try to explain to people is that the, the issue of expertise and credibility and authority in paranormal subjects is, is very important because anybody and anybody c can call themselves a paranormal expert and a ghost expert, ghost hunter, whatever else. That's all well and good. But of course, the, the, at the end of the day, the fact is that ghosts have not been proven to exist. I wish they had. It'd be cool. I would, I'd love to be the person that finds hard evidence of ghosts. But at the end of the day, we don't know for sure that ghosts exist. We don't know for sure that Bigfoot exists. We don't know for sure that psychic powers exist. You can argue there's evidence on both sides, but I think almost nobody would, would dispute the fact that these have yet to be proven. So then the question becomes, well, how can you be an expert on these things? Well, the fact is that, that it depends on how you, how you define what is it you're studying. So for example, um, sociologists and, and economists are experts on intangible and abstract subjects. It's quite possible to be an expert on the folklore of something. Uh, or the concept of something that may or may not exist. And the example I have here is, uh, is a priest or a rabbi. They, a priest or rabbi is a legitimate expert and authority on a, specific, on a specific set of beliefs that may or may not be objectively true, right? No one's yet proven that God exists. Uh, and so, you know, again, to, to, to believers, it's a clearly, clearly true to others, it's not true. But at the end of the day, you know, a, a, a rabbi and, a, and an imam are going to have different, different ideas about what's been proven and what hasn't. So you, you can look at these people and you can say, yes, you are an authority on this particular belief system, but that belief system is not necessarily anchored to anything in reality. I mean, I, I, you know, when I was 20 years ago, I was an expert on D&D, 4th &D, edition. Yeah, fourth edition. You I mean I, I I knew all I all the stuff in the monster manual. You know I knew what all the you know to hit AC zero. I mean I all the different types of dragons and what sort of potions. I was an expert on that, 
They're not real, but I was an expert on it. So it's the same thing here. So I'm an expert in many areas of the paranormal, including the chupacabra and ghosts, in terms of the history, evidence, and the, and the evidence offered for them. So for example, you know, you, if you want to talk about the history of, of, of evidence offered for Bigfoot and ghosts, I can talk to you for a couple hours on that. What do you want to know? We can talk about that. That doesn't mean that it's, it's necessarily real, so I can talk about the folklore behind things. I talked earlier today about urban legends. I can talk about the vanishing hitchhiker urban legends and some of these stories and you know, what are called folk tales, friend of a friend tales, and how these, uh, these legends get started. So again, there's nothing tangible behind it, but we can certainly be experts on it. And you can also be an expert on the psychology of the experience. And this, this goes back to my background in psychology. And so when I interview eyewitnesses who tell me they saw a ghost, or they saw a Bigfoot, or they saw this, or they saw that, uh, I can, because of my background and just having the experience, I can talk to them and say, you know, I, I believe you had this experience. I, I don't doubt that at all. The question is, is what you experienced actually a ghost? Is what you experienced actually a Bigfoot or whatever? And maybe it was. I'm not saying it wasn't. But we need to, the, the, you, we can't just assume that whatever, whatever your interpretation is, is the correct one. So, and th this is an important part, and I don't expect you to read the whole thing. I'll just touch on this quickly. But in, in a lot of discussions about paranormal topics, the subjects themselves, ghosts, Bigfoot, etc., they're treated as if there's some universally agreed upon definition of what they are. But there's not. I can give you half a half dozen different definitions of ghosts. Some people think, for example, that, that there are projections that, from inside the mind that go out into the, into the real world, that, that, they, that ghosts are created by the human consciousness. Other people believe that ghosts are created by, uh, if, there's a, um, if there's an untimely death, whatever that might mean. I'm, presumably most deaths are untimely unless they're suicides. Uh, but some people believe that ghosts, I mean, there's all sorts of different theories. So there's lots of different definitions. It's not as if everyone knows exactly what a ghost is. Now, for example, with Bigfoot, uh, you know, there, there is a sort of common conception about what Bigfoot is. Bipedal, uh, you know, uh, covered with hair, lives in the Pacific Northwest, although they've actually been sighted all across the country. Uh, so there's they're sort of a general agreed upon idea, but no, we don't know what it is. So we can't, we can't say that, you know, this, this is necessarily true. And so what's important to understand from an investigative point of view is that when a person says, I saw a ghost, or I saw a Bigfoot, all that means is that they are they're putting a label on an experience they had. They're saying, what I experienced most closely fits ghost. What I experienced most closely fits Bigfoot, right? So you, 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 you have, you have some, something that they experience that they can't explain immediately, might, might, might be able to explain it at all. So if they're, let's say they're, they're hiking in the woods, they see something weird in the woods, what is it? It's a Bigfoot, right? If it's in the sky, what is it? UFO, UFO right. If they're, if they're out on, on um, um, Lake Tahoe. Lake, Lake Tahoe has a, has a monster. I don't know if you know that. Tahoe Tessie. Uh, Okanagan, Lake Okanagan, Lake Champlain. If you're out on a lake, it's a lake monster. Uh, if you're in a spooky house uh, late at night or somewhere in the cemetery, you're going interpre to interpret it as a ghost. And so it depends on the context. So whatever... Whatever context you're in, both psychologically and culturally and, 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 and actually environmentally, is going to determine what, 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 you, what you see and how you experience it. And so therefore, this is the problem that I see oftentimes, that, is that investigators will go into it as, uh, sort of without recognizing that what they're trying to seek is, a, is an explanation for an experience. Now that experience might in fact be a ghost. That experience, they might have actually seen a ghost, they might have actually seen a Bigfoot, whatever. I'm not saying they didn't, but you need to understand that, that we're not looking for, uh, before you can get to, is this a real creature, is this a real phenomena, you need to get to, you need to understand what the psychology of their experience is. And so you can't claim to positively identify something without knowing the, the nature of that thing. I mean, correctly identifying X necessarily means that you know what X is. Uh, what distinguishes, what established characteristics it has, that distinguishes it from Y or Z, there's no way around it. So, you, you know, I, I saw a Bigfoot. Well, you don't know what a Bigfoot is. Okay, I saw, uh, you know, I saw something that was big and hairy in the woods. Okay, that's great. I'll go with that. The problem is that something that's big and hairy in the woods, that's not necessarily a Bigfoot. Uh, and so you have to go from there. So once the mystery is once the mystery is approached from this angle, it becomes solvable. Once you understand that all they're talking about is an experience, a, a, a basically a descriptor 
Uh, at that point, then you can get into actually doing the investigations because you're not, you're not hung up on trying to, trying to identify the characteristics of a particular ghost or a particular uh, psychic experience. So you have to, you know, the, 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 the investigation becomes not one of identifying the Bigfoot or ghost, but of trying to understand what the eyewitness experienced and what they interpreted as that. So in order to, you have to use meaningful labels to understand the phenomenon. I get this question a lot. Uh, it's it, very tiresome to me, but I, 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 I do it. Uh, in my book, Scientific Paranormal Investigation, I uh, devoted a whole chapter to this. The question is, uh, why is what's, uh, what, what the TV show Ghost Hunters do, uh, you know, wh why, why, are they, why, why aren't they doing science? Um, and the, there's, well, there's, I don't have enough time to give you all the reasons, but one of the problems is that most of the amateur uh, ghost hunting groups today, they're influenced by people uh, such as uh, Grant, who I just saw half an hour ago, uh, we're signing, signing, uh, signing autographs. Uh, and, uh, and his show, the Ghost Hunter show, and what, essentially what they're doing is they're doing what's called anomaly hunting. Instead of taking the claims that are presented to them, that is, you know, a claim is that any haunted house on moonless nights, um, on, you know, in, on the third Thursday of every month, there is a female spirit apparition that goes down a hallway, that's a testable claim. You can be there on a moonless night on the third Thursday, either a, either a, you know, some sort of female figure goes down a hallway or she doesn't. This is testable. So that's the sort of claim that you have to investigate and, and, and solve. And so what, what, what the anomaly hunters do, including the ghost hunters, is that they essentially, they look around for things. They're like, all right, well, let's walk around in, in, a, in a haunted house. Turn the lights off, of course. That's always the first step. I've never gotten that. It's like, if you're looking for something, even ghosts, Turning the lights off is a bad idea, because humans, I'll, I'll just give you a quick, quick uh, lesson, basic biology. Humans need light to see. <laughs> I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but this is why there's lights on me that I, I barely see you guys. And, and if you actually cut off, if you turn off the lights, you're intentionally reducing the amount of information available to you to identify whatever it is. So you're, you're greatly impeding yourself. You're, 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 you're going out of your way to make your job harder. Uh, you know, a, a quick demonstration. Oh my God, a quick demonstration. <gasps> exactly, thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Yes. And why was it harder to see when the lights were off? Because the lights were off, that's why. And so, well see, here, here's the problem. So the ghost hunters, but here, why do they do it? Because it makes dramatic TV. They can turn on the infrared and like, oh my God, it's so creepy. Well, no, this is, this is not doing any good here. Uh, I mean, if, if, think about this for a second. If, if it benefited you to have less information, then really what you should do is basically, you know, uh, put, put earplugs in, uh, you know, put a blindfold on, wrap yourself in like a rug, and like put yourself in a closet or maybe like in a, in a sensory isolation chamber. If, if, if that's truly the premise that you're operating on, then you should see ghosts all over the place. I personally prefer more information when I'm doing an investigation, which is, I, which is why I like to leave the lights on. Now, I've had a person come up to me uh, and tell me, well, you know, well, well you know, <laughs> you know, you know, the reason they do that is that ghosts, they, they glow in the dark. And, and so that's why it's smart to turn the lights off, Mr. Smarty Pants. I said, well, actually, you know, the fact is that ghosts are sighted in a wide variety of contexts, including during the daytime. In fact, most ghosts are not seen at night, oddly enough. They're, like, and certainly not under the conditions that ghost hunters are, are, are doing. For example, turning the light, this is, ah, I don't get it. They, they turn the lights off, they turn flashlights on. <laughs> what are you doing? Do you want the lights on, or do you want the lights off? What's this, what's this half-ass turn lights off, flashlight, what are we doing? I'm yelling at the TV and they're ignoring me and it's just pissing me off. So anyway, the, uh, the, uh, this is one of the problems with the TV ghost hunters. And so what they're doing is they're anomaly hunting. And so what they do is they go into an area and they try, they're essentially generating their own claim. Instead of addressing and investigating the claims presented to them by the eyewitnesses, 
they sort of, oh, that's all great, whatever, whatever. We're going to go do our own thing. We're going to wander around this, this dark place with the lights off and then the flashlights on for, you know, four, six hours, blah, blah, blah. And they record all this stuff in cameras and video, whatever else. And then they go home and they, they sort of, because it's hours and hours and hours and hours of this stuff. And so they go home, and they, it takes time to process it, and they, they often have the different people spending hours going through it, coming through it, and eventually, usually what happens, if you record enough hours, then there'll be something weird, eventually. Someone will fart, or there'll be a glitch, or something will happen. And they're like, oh my god, did you see this? You know, on hour 13.402, there's a weird light in this. Well, okay, what the hell is it? I don't know. Must be a ghost. No! No, you're doing this the wrong way, guys. Here's the deal. Uh, is Grant here? Okay. Grant, if you're here, if you're listening to me, this is not the way to do this. Because the problem here is that, is that, if you, is that using that, that technique of anomaly hunting, you have lost the opportunity to do any meaningful investigation. Why? Because that weird sound that you think might be a ghost, that weird light that happened to come across this thing right next to a window near a busy freeway that you think might be a ghost... You don't know what that was because you didn't investigate at the time. You didn't find it until a week later when one of your guys was going, oh, this is weird. Well, you don't know what it was because you didn't look. There's no way to go back and recreate what you, what you should have been investigating four days ago, a week ago. It's, it's, it's a lost cause. It's totally unscientific. And so anomaly hunting reverses the process of, um, thank you, <laughs> reverses the process of, uh, uh, of you know, sp scientific investigation begins with a specific claim. Again, someone says, they offer a claim. I saw this, I experienced this, I, here's a photograph, here's this thing that could be a Bigfoot bone, whatever the hell it is. They bring it to you and you, you investigate it to the best of your ability. And anomaly hunting reverses the process and it essentially puts the investigators in the position of needlessly generating new claims because Every time they see something they, weird they can't explain, it might be a ghost. It's like, you're, no, no, go, go, go with what claims are being offered to you. W work from that instead of starting your own. So it's a, ca it's a classic case of, of arguing from ignorance, which is a common fallacy. It means basically, I don't understand X, therefore it's anomaly. I don't know what made this weird sound. I don't know what had this light, therefore it must be a ghost. And I see this routinely. Uh, Bigfoot sightings, ghostfoot sightings, whatever else, where people will, will experience something they, 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 they don't understand and they'll assume, well, this must be paranormal. Like, no, it's just something you don't understand. But I see things I don't understand all the time. And it, 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 at a fundamental level, it's incredibly arrogant. It's fascinating to me. You talk to these people, and because uh, I've had people say that to me, they'll be like, you know, I saw this weird thing and, and this must be a ghost. I'm like, because we can't come up with you know, any other explanation. I said, May, let me make sure I understand this. So, because you can't figure it out, it, it's unknowable. Right? Nobody, if you don't know, if you personally can't find an explanation for this, then no one else does. You're so smart, you have access to so much information that you are the pinnacle of knowledge. And if it's, if it's beyond you, then it's beyond all of us. Bullshit. There's all sorts of things that, this is why we go to doctors. There's something wrong with us. Think about this, right? This, this is why we go to doctors. This is why we go to mechanics. This is why we go to people who have more knowledge than we do. I don't know, is something wrong with my back? I don't know what hurts. I don't know, what, did I break a rib? I don't know. Well, shit, it must be paranormal. No, you got something wrong with your back. Go to a doctor, you idiot. Go to an expert who knows what they're doing. And they'll, well, yeah, you, you pulled a disc, this and that. You hear a clanking in the car, well, 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 paranormal. No, it's not paranormal. Go to, go to mechanic. They're the experts. That's what they do. But, it, but, it, but it, when it comes to, when it comes to, to paranormal investigation, that they turn that on their heads. So, uh, you know, I just talk about anomaly hunting in science. You know, scientists, as a rule, don't spend their time searching for anomalies. This is something I point out to people. Geologists don't spend their career sampling soils around the world looking for anything unusual and epidemiologists don't randomly screen the public hoping to find some new disease. That's not how that works. What happens is the anomalies rise to the surface. The anomalies occur, and it, so there's an outbreak of Ebola. It's not that, you know, in, in, in Africa, you know, a couple weeks ago, it's not that people were, were constantly screening the entire world for Ebola. It's like this, it suddenly appeared. Once it appeared, that's something to investigate. It's not, an, to do otherwise is anomaly hunting. You know, the example I give is conjoined twins are an anomaly. 
But it would be pointless for a researcher to spend his time in hospitals around the world waiting for a pair of conjoined twins to appear. Oh, I'll be at your hospital next week. Well, Topa conjoined twin appears. That's not how that works. You, 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 when it happens, you go investigate it. You don't, you don't, you don't spend, your, spend decades doing it. A couple final points, so get, time, get some time for the Q&A here. A couple things that what I try and impress upon people is you have to take the subject seriously. And this is one thing that I've really tried to do. I've been an investigator for 16, 17 years now. Uh, and I, I make a sincere, legitimate effort to, to understand and, under, and explain the, the, uh, the, the, the mysteries that I'm presented with and the claims that, I'm, that I, 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 I see. Um, I remember I was, uh, I was talking at a Bigfoot conference in, uh, in Pocatello, Idaho, about five years ago. And I was the token skeptic, of course. You know, everyone else in the room believed in Bigfoot, and I'm the guy who's like, well, actually, yeah, well, so. so I, I was on stage, and I'm, I'm talking to him about, very politely, of course, dodging tomatoes and Bigfoot scat, um, explaining why, why some of the evidence that they, they're presenting is, is dubious at best, including the fact, by the way, that do you, do, do you guys know what the, the best evidence for Bigfoot still is today? It's a, yes, it's the Patterson Gimlin film that was shot in 1967. This is during the Johnson administration. All right, think about that for a second. Today, 2014, the best evidence for Bigfoot goes back to before I was born. There's something wrong with that, guys. Because people these days, they got high definition cameras, they got cell phones. We should be seeing a staggering improvement in the quality of Bigfoot evidence. Not Bigfoot, ghost evidence, UFO evidence, all these other things. There's more video cameras and higher quality videos and, and just more, more, people are more able to document the world around them than ever before in human history. It doesn't make sense that essentially the evidence would have flatlined. That the evidence for Bigfoot is no better today than it was in 67. And frankly, the evidence for ghosts is no better today than it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 100 years ago. There, there's this vanishing evidence horizon. And I, I see that it's fascinating. You, you may know the, the Fate magazine. There's a couple nods. There. It's not a great magazine. But anyway, it, it, it goes, what I find interesting is it dates back to the 40s and 50s. And so every now and then I'll pull one out, like, you know, from 1953. Well, you know, evidence of extraterrestrials is going to be found any day now. Like, wow, 53, how's that going, guys? I guess that didn't really work out. You know, you know the Bigfoot evidence, this and that. And, and the problem is that the, the, the people who, who spend their time researching this, they, they don't recognize this vanishing evidence horizon. They don't recognize that the evidence is not getting incrementally better. And it should, because in every other area of human investigation and human endeavor, geology, uh, you know, botany, medicine, in every other realm the, where we know it actually exists, where it's a field of study and people study it and can touch it and, and examine it, the evidence is incrementally better. There's published research. There's, it's, there's a building body of knowledge. And you don't have that in these subjects. And at some point, you have to ask yourself why. Second point, it's not enough to simply doubt. Oh, I didn't finish. I was talking about the Bigfooter. Sorry. OK, so I'm in the Bigfoot conference dodging tomatoes and Bigfoot scat. And, I'm, I'm, and I, said, uh, I said, all right, so. Uh, yeah, so I, I, they weren't really hostile, but, you know, I was getting a little some evil eyes. I said, look, I'm not the enemy here. I'm not the bad guy. I said, you, you need to understand, addressing the Bigfoot crowd, I said, a lot of you, you know, a lot of you have seen Bigfoot, you believe in Bigfoot, you sell Bigfoot books, this and that and the other. I said, you need to understand that out on, this, on the main street, the John Q. public thinks you guys are crazy. They think you're full of shit. They think that you're a nut job who's out there looking for Bigfoot, old yahoos and rednecks and that. I said, I'm taking you seriously. I will listen to your Bigfoot story. I will look at your Bigfoot evidence. I will look at your photographs and your videos. I will, I will look at what you have. So I'm willing to put forth the effort and make a sincere, legitimate effort to examine this thing. So I'm not, I'm not the bad guy here. I'm not your enemy. I'm, try, I'm trying to give this, this field scientific legitimacy. Same thing with, with, with ghost hunters. Every now and then I, I come across um, amateur ghost hunters, both locally in, in New Mexico where I live and elsewhere, sometimes for TV shows. And I say, look, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to help you improve your work. If you want ghosts to be accepted as, as valid entities, if you, if you want, and they're so desperate for credibility, if, if you, this is really what you want, then use science. 
Science is how we prove things, guys. Science is how we, how we get ahead. Science is how we build knowledge. And if you're not going to do science, like the ghost hunters don't do science, then th this is why ghosts are in their 10th season of not finding ghosts. Finding Bigfoot. What, three seasons now? Still haven't found Bigfoot. How's that work? Is there a prize now for I don't know. I'll, I'll <laughs> 50 bucks in a beer. Look, I mean... <laughs> Look, I mean, the, the, the fact is that the, the, this is not getting any better. And so people need to, you know, so that, that's part of it, is, is that you have to take it seriously. And this is what pisses me off about, about the, 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 the people who look into these, these subjects. It's not that I, I think it's too silly to dismiss, because I, I, frankly, that, that, I find that offensive. I've had people say, well, you know, you know, oh, you waste your time on Bigfoot and ghosts and, you know, chupacabras, you know, isn't this all silly? I'm like, no, it's not all too silly. I've spent... Years of my life on these things. I've spent, I spent 18 months doing an investigation into psychic detectives. I spent five years researching the chupacabra. I solved that mystery through a lot of hard work and effort. This is not too stupid for me. This is what I do. Because I think the truth is valuable. I want to know. I want to know, is the, are these things real or not real? If ghosts are real, that's great. I don't have anything against that. If Bigfoot's real, I want to be there. I, I, I'm not a debunker. I'm not, I'm not trying to disprove these things. I want to know the truth. If the truth is these things are out there, that's great. Then we need to ex understand and explore them. If they're not out there, if these things that people talk about as this unexplained phenomenon, these mysterious things, if these things aren't truly out there, then the question becomes, in some ways, a more interesting one, which is, why are people reporting things that don't exist? Why are people experiencing things and interpreting them as being Bigfoot, ghosts, psychic phenomena, blah, blah, it, when, if that's not actually happening? And oftentimes the answer goes to psychology. So you have to take it seriously. It's also it's not enough to simply doubt. Doubt is as cheap as belief. I, I come across this occasionally with skeptics where I'll talk to somebody who's like, well, so, well, you know, uh, so uh, we're talking about ghosts or astrology or something. I go, oh, well, we all know that ghosts, are, uh, you know, ghosts aren't real. It's like... We don't all know that ghosts are real. In fact, a great many uh, in the public, if you look at polls, uh, I think last time I was looking at polls, like 40% of people believe in haunted houses. So many people don't know that ghosts aren't real. In fact, many people truly believe them. And same, you know, uh, angels, guardian. I mean, there's all sorts of different things that people believe in. So, uh, so you know, these things can't just sort of be dismissed out of hand. And I said, well, you know, why, why do you think that ghosts aren't real? Well, you know, it just, it just seems like... I don't know. Well, like, you don't know? Well, then, then what are you doing calling yourself a skeptic? You say you're informed about these things. I ask you, I mean, I have, I have good reasons, and I can sit here and tell you why, in my experience, in my research, ghosts are not likely to exist. I can, I can, well, I can talk about that for a couple hours if you want. But I, I can talk, I, I'm not just going to say, well, that can't be true. No, that, that's not how you do it. You have to, you have to understand, the, 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 you have to do your research and, and understand the reasons behind that. Also, do the, uh, do the, uh, understand the history of skepticism and what we do. Uh, you know, the, the, the history of, of, uh, of skeptical investigations uh, is not, you know, a lot of people think, you know, only goes back to James Randi, for example, who's uh, very, still around. He did you know, lots of great work uh, exposing Uri Geller, the spoonbender, uh, in the 1970s. Uh, Joe Nickel, Harry Houdini, um, some people know, some people don't. He was uh, spent a lot of his time uh, exposing fraudulent spirit mediums. He was, of course, a magician and illusionist, but he, uh, because he was a magician, he knew many of the ways in which uh, mediums would, would essentially fake contact in the dead. He, he went out to expose that. Uh, Oscar Funks, uh, he's, he's great. Did anybody know the, the Clever Han story? All right, I'll, I'll, tell, I'll tell a quick Clever Han story. Okay, so it's just a great story. So, okay, so we've got Clever Hans. Clever Hans was a horse. Very crazy, huh? Wow, that's, that's really wacky, Ben. Great, thanks a lot. Clever Hans was a horse who could, uh, who could do math. Yeah, what? Mm -hmm. What, bro? Yeah, he could do math. Uh, he, could, he, could, he could speak several languages, which is odd for a horse. Uh, let's be honest. Uh, he, he could do the months. He knew when he was born. You're thinking, wow, most horses don't know when they were born. This one did. Very, very weird. So, so, uh, so uh, Clever Hans was exhibited, I, may be getting the, I think it was the, the late 1800s, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe the early 1800s, early 1900s. And uh, he was all over the world. I mean, you know, this is sort of P.T. Barnum era, you know, like the, the 
the horse that can do math. And this is not you could do algebra and all sorts. I can't do algebra. I was like, well, the horse is very cool. Look at that. So, so, so Hans, it was just amazing because he could actually do this. So he would, he would have people would come in from, uh, this is in Germany, and people would come in from all over Europe to see this amazing horse. They would pay money. and like So what would happen is, that, that uh, his, his owner would be sitting there next to him, and, the, and he would say, Hans, what's three plus two? And of course, because horses can't talk, uh, he, except for Ed, right? Ed could do it. Um, he, would, he would stamp out the number, three plus two, you'd go, five, there you go, three, there you go. And, and everyone, the, every, the crowd's astonished, oh my God, this is, how did, three plus two, like, Hans, you know, what, what, what month were you born in? So he would have a calendar, January, February, March, tap, April. What date? First, second, third, fourth, April 4th. He's right. He was born April 4th. No one knew, how to, no one knew what was going on. Was it a trick? Was it a hoax? Did this horse really know how to do uh, addition and subtraction and, uh, and, and speak these other languages? No. What happened was... The mystery was finally solved when a psychologist by the name of Oscar Fungst investigated it. And he found that uh, what had happened was the horse was being unconsciously cued. So what happened is that whenever the horse's owner would get to the, to the correct answer, you know, one, two, three, four, five, he would, he would, he would lean in just slightly, or he would, he would have a body position motion, uh, just slightly change his position, and the horse would see this. And, and so he would know that he was supposed to stop stomping. So he didn't know anything. He was just being cued unconsciously by, by the owner. And the way he knew that, in fact, it's really brilliant testing, uh, he, he had somebody, for example, if you take the owner away and you bring in just someone out of the crowd, say, uh, you know, what's three plus two, and he doesn't know, well, of course, he would know what the answer was. But, but or for example, you say, yeah, what, when were you born? If he didn't know, he'd just keep tapping. Oh, January, February, March, okay, we're back in March again, okay. Uh, but, uh, because you take away the, the, and it was on all unconscious killing, but it's a fascinating case study. I think it's on Wikipedia, the Clever Hans. Uh, it's just a brilliant case, a uh, hundred years ago, a little more than that, of, of, of a good skeptical investigation into an unknown phenomenon. Benjamin Franklin, I was named for him. He did a, in, incredible investigations into Anton Mesmer and mesmerism. And again, I don't have time to talk about that, but there's, there's all sorts of uh, rich history of, of skeptical investigators that I'm proud to call, call myself among, and, and many are still today. And uh, so the last one is, there is, is the evidence horizon. And that's what I mentioned earlier, is this, 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 this notion that the evidence is always around the corner, over and over and over again. The evidence, for, you know, the hard evidence for, you know, for ghosts is around the corner. Psychic powers, I, I heard this over and over again, and it, it's, it's, it's never here. It's never here. There, there's always, it's always just, just a little further out. And, you know, look, the, the fact is that science is, uh, it, it's, it's, it's self-correcting. And so any, any belief that we have about the, the current status of science, you know, it's only subject to new information and whatever else. And so there could be a study next month or next year that, that undermines or, you know, something else that we all believe. Same thing with ghosts. It could be that right now, as I'm speaking to you, it could be in Loch Ness, Somebody is finding a washed-up Loch Ness monster. That's absolutely possible. Someone's like, oh, shit, well, there's a big thing there. It's, no one knows what it is. Well, clearly it's a monster. It could be they're finding one right now, and we're going to hear about it on CNN tomorrow. Not likely, but it's certainly possible. And if so, that's great. I want to be the first one there. But people need to recognize the context and the history of these claims because it really goes back farther. So we still have about 10 minutes, so that's time for some Q&A. Hope I haven't gone too long. Hope I've given you something to, to think about and some, some grist for the mill. Uh, there's my book, Scientific Paranormal Investigation. Uh, it's available on Amazon and elsewhere, and there's a caricature of me. <laughs> as a sort of Sherlock Holmes, actually done by um, uh, Sarah Mayhew, who is a manga artist. So anyway, I will pause for applause and then take questions. <laughs> Come on. All right, there you go. Line up the microphone, please. Oh, oh we have Mark Dissler. Um, as a member of the Independent Investigations Group of Atlanta, we get contacted on a regular basis with people saying, I have something paranormal, I've seen a ghost, can you come out and investigate? But we spend a lot of time internally debating whether we should go investigate due to the fact that maybe somebody contacts us through email and you can read the email and say, 
I'm not sure this person is mentally all there. Mm -hmm. So how do you handle, well, how do you get contacted normally for, say, an investigation? And how do you handle that if you think maybe this person really needs help rather than a paranormal investigator? That, yeah, that, that's a great question. Uh, you know, what I try to do is, um, it, it's difficult. I, I, again, I have a background in psychology, so I, I try and guide them towards, I mean, I have some, some, some ability to sort of work with them and try to get, get a bearing on what's going to help them out. I remember uh, I was living in Buffalo at the time, and a guy contacted me who he was a, he was a, um, uh, it was a middle-aged black guy, and he had a, he had a, he had a like an egg-sized tumor on his neck. And I, he contacted me out of the blue. I'd never just sort of wandered in, and, and he started talking to me. I don't know where he got my break. How did he get in my office? I'm like shit. <laughs> How did he get through security? But uh, he uh, he asked me uh, if there was a doctor that could remove a ghost from his neck. And I said, N not, not really. I, I, why do you think there's a ghost in your neck? And he said that he'd seen uh, the TV show Ghost Hunters, and, it, and he, he, he'd seen some episode that made it sound like a ghost had been in a house and had been driven out by, like, har harm, some sort of frequency, harmonic thing, whatever else. And he believed that, that that's what had happened to him and that it had gotten in his neck. And so at that point, I was trying to... He clearly needed help, and so here, here's what I told him. I said, "Well, I said, because uh, I knew that if I if I was totally straight with him, and I said there's no ghost in your neck, he's not going to believe me because he he totally bought into this." And so I, I said, "Well, what you need to do is see a psychologist, because I said I don't know if there's a ghost in your neck or not. I didn't I, I didn't want to feed his thing, but on the other hand, I, I, if I if I just flat out turned him away, then it wouldn't have helped him." So I said, "I said." I said, I don't know whether there's a ghost in your neck or not. I don't think there is, but even if there is, you need to see a psychologist because it could be traumatic when it leaves. And he's like, oh, yeah, I sort of see that. And so I, I, I guided him to, to social services, and I had having her back. I, I don't know if the ghost is still in his neck or not. Um, but so I, I tried to sort of do my best to help him out with that. Uh, so it, it, it's difficult. I mean, the, the, that's one of the things where the, it's also important to recognize that most people who come to me with claims are not mentally ill. Lots of perfectly ordinary, sane people see ghosts. Lots of perfectly sane, ordinary people see Bigfoot and, lot, and, and UFOs in the sky. It, it's, there's nothing pathological about that. It's, it, everyone mis, misunderstands things. It, it, there's nothing unusual about that. The question is, how do they, why do they interpret it that way? Uh, so, thankfully, I've only had to deal with truly mentally ill people on a handful of occasions. And usually, uh, I try, and to answer your question, I try not to encourage that, that their delusion and try to sort of guide them towards, towards help that, that, they, you know, that might hopefully work. Questions, comments? Come on, some of you have something to say. Well, well when, when somebody contacts you and let's say they're not saying they got a growth on their neck or something, which mm -hmm. is obviously needs to be looked at by a, a different type yeah, of Yeah, somebody. Um, they say, oh, I, I've seen this ghost a number of times in my attic. And where, where we, we, again, have a lot of debate internally at the IIG is we, we're trying to determine, is this something worth investigating, <laughs> mm -hmm. and is this person really serious? So it's not a clear cut. Uh, right. I've got a growth here that I think is a ghost. To, right. You know, how do how do we weed those out? Because we're you know on one hand we want to go investigate, and the other it's like we don't want to make a situation worse if this person is not. Right. Well, well, one way I handle that is uh, is whenever possible I I try to only go with cases that have the best evidence. Um, so for example, if someone just says to me I believe there's a ghost in my house, I'll say why, and if they just say well I just do, then that's great. I good for I, there's nothing I can do with that. It, it, you know. Do you have photos? Did other people see it? I mean, I, I don't know what the phenomena was, and so that would be one way of weeding it out, is if the person really has nothing to work with, no, no, no evidence to present, if it's simply a belief, well, believe whatever you want. I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not being facetious, but I mean, there's nothing I can do with that. So that might be one way to sort of weeding out, is it just you know, if someone comes to you and they, they clearly need, are in that situation, if they're not presenting evidence for you that's falsifiable and, and testable, then it's like, I, there's... I mean, I'm sorry. There, there's nothing I can do to help you. Um, so, yeah. 
Um, I, I, I want to know how you keep an open mind when you're constantly investigating things that turn out to not be true. And the answer is always no. How do you how do you come to a new investigation with an open mind saying there, at least in the back of your mind, there might be something to this when, you know, your track record would say <laughs> track there's record definitely just not otherwise. anything to this. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, part of the answer is that um, that I, 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 I do think it's very important to keep an open mind. Uh, you know, like, like, the, like the saying is, you know, keep an open mind but not so open that your, your brain falls out. Um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, I, with each case, I, part of me really hopes that there's going to be a ghost this time. Part of me really hopes that there's this is going to be the the Bigfoot video that's not as as crappy as the rest of them, um, and it does it does sort of get get um, you know after you I mean look people send me Bigfoot videos and ghost videos on a regular basis and I, I when I can I try to help them out but at some point I, I I've done been, I've been doing this a long time I can recognize these things and so it's usually it's pretty clear to me this is this is what this is um, the the other the other answer is that is that I try to use each case as an opportunity to learn something new if I can. So for example, be, each case is different. There's, you know, there, there are certain, you know, there's, there's ghost photos that are a certain way, there's this and there's that. But with each case, there's individuals, I, I've, lear I've learned something, to be honest, I've learned something new with, with every case I've investigated. There's always little twists, little turns, something I hadn't thought of, somebody who um, just, uh, just, different circumstances that, that help inform me for future investigations. So that's how I try to look at it is, yes, you know, I, I'm hoping that this is going to be real. Given my background and knowledge and experience, this is not likely to be real, but I'm open to it being real. And, and even if I sort of, even, I'm, even if I, I kind of know that it's not going to turn into anything that's, you know, that, that, that's, that's, that's real or valid, but then the question becomes, well, again, what was their experience? You know, what can I, what can I learn from talking to this one person um, that I can use in a later investigation? Say, oh, you know what? This, this was like this person in this other case. So it's, it's sort of like investigators build a body of background experience that helps inform later ones. No. You talked about how, why you do what you do and how enthusiastic about it that you are. But what do you do? in the face of criticism, even from people within the skeptic community who say you're just a Bigfoot skeptic and, and you know, that's been done, let's move on to important things. Have there been times when your investigations have helped people change things? Yeah, yeah, I mean, that, that's a good question. I, you know, I think that, um, you know, it's easy to, do, to sort of dismiss people as like, oh, I mean, again, on occasion, I'm like, oh, he's just a Bigfoot skeptic, this or that. But the fact is that, in fact, they, they don't really know what I do because I, I do a wide variety of stuff. I write about urban legends. I write about uh, mass hysterias. I write about conspiracy theories. I mean, the, the, it's sort of ironic in that the, the things that I'm best known for are only a small slice of what I actually do. I mean, yeah, I, I'm known for Bigfoot and ghosts and chupacabras. I do media criticism. I do I, all sorts of other stuff. And so, you know, you can sort of pick and choose if you want, but the fact is that I've got a big body of stuff. I did, I did a film plagiarism. Uh, in the next issue of Skeptical Inquirer magazine, I have an expose on eHarmony, whether their logarithms are scientific or not, uh, sort of consumer advocacy there. <laughs> Uh, it's a, it's hot Derek 102, um, and but 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 you know it's also important to re recognize. For example, you know there, there are cases where I've actually helped people, and it's very been very rewarding. For example, there was a case I investigated in Buffalo. It's, it's mentioned in my investigations book, uh, where there was a, a, a couple that had been. Um, it was right on Halloween, and they believed that their house was haunted. It was a older. Uh, it was a couple and their young child. And they were terrified. They, they truly believed that there was a ghost in their house. And they'd gone to a psychic who, who could basically confirm their fears. And they were, they were scared. And so it wasn't until they contacted me. I went in there. I did an investigation free of charge. I spent my own time, my own dime. And I ended up solving the case. And they were back in their home in time for Thanksgiving. And that's a case of where it, it wasn't some abstract, oh, we're, we're educating the world. Like, these are real people who needed help. 
and they came to, after going to these ghost hunters and psychics who were misled and may actually made the problem worse, they finally came to a skeptic, and I said, yeah, I will take, I'll take you seriously, I'll do my, my, my best to investigate, and they were back in their home, and I, it was very rewarding to sort of see that, because it's, it's actually helping real people, it's not just sort of abstract. Yeah? Have you done uh, anything around a large group awareness trainings, as far as debunking that? I didn't catch that one. LGAT, large group awareness training. Have you run into anything like that? Uh, I haven't personally. I, I've heard some about it. I, off the top of my head, I haven't done anything particularly into, into that now. And a follow-up, I like the phrase, uh, doubt is as cheap as belief. Have you found anything that was doubted that you were able to verify? Um, well, that's a good question. Probably the closest, I would think, would be maybe... Um, Intuition. I think there may be something to intuition. I, I don't. By that, I don't mean something supernatural. But just again, having a background in psychology, there's ways in which we can sort of have knowledge without knowing how we know it. So we can pick up cues from the environment. Um, and so that's that's probably the closest. I think we're at end. If it's real quick, I'll I'll see what I can do. Oh, I was wondering if you had heard about the UFO sightings in Houston, like this past week. Not this past week. I've I've been uh, I've been here, so I'll check into it. Anyway, thank you all for coming, Word and Appreciate your time.